because I he was telling me that at lunch, and I wanted to make make sure somebody had written that down. Yeah, and that's when his wife said, "Oh, it's already on the internet." So. Uh, at dinner, <coughs> dinner last night, I'm sitting with a guy. I don't know. I just read about him on the. Yeah, because he's got a big mouth. He tells you a lot of stuff. <laughs> yes, he did. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think we're ready to begin. All right. So I'm going to ask you some preliminary questions, like your name. Yeah. All right. My name your is name. Bob Bob McLean. And, and when and where were you born? Oh, when and where? Well, I was born in Minneapolis in uh, 1923. Okay. Um, I guess I should also say for record, my name is Ed Clendenin, and I'm with the 376 Veterans Association, and today is September 6th of 2007, and we're conducting the interview with Bob at the 2007 uh, Association Annual Reunion. So, okay, uh, which squadron were you in? I was in the 515th. 515th? Yeah. And I, were you a member of an air crew? I was uh, on uh, M.L. Johnson's crew. I don't know the crew number without doing that's, research. That's fine. But uh, Maurice L. Johnson, which uh, he never wished to be called Maurice. We called him Johns. Johns? Yeah. J-O-N-S? Yeah. Okay. And what position were you? I was the uh, flight engineer. And in our crew, mostly, I flew in the waste because Johns wanted me to be able to see whether the engines were pouring oil. Ah, okay. Other, other pilots had other schemes. Because yeah. usually the engineer flew the top turret, is that correct? Uh, yeah, our uh, uh, top turret gunner was the radio man. Was the radio man. Yeah. So when, at what point in the mission would he climb up into the top turret? That probably would be uh, Late on the run until the run. You know, we would be after you'd missed the, the getting initial close. point. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, it'd have to be sometime in case of fighters, you got to have a man up there. Sure. Yeah. Okay, so going back in time, uh, you said you were born in '23. So yeah. I assume you, at, in 1941, you they didn't draft you. You didn't enlist, or did you enlist? They, they, they did draft me. I was uh, a student at Stanford University. At Stanford. Okay. And. Uh, my class, uh, you know, they, we all knew we were going to have to go in. So most of the guys signed up with the Navy, V-12, Army, whatever, you know. Uh -huh. But it turned out that I am uh, a little deficient in red-green perception. Colorblind? Colorblind. And I was unable to get into any program. Really? So, uh, and I wasn't so patriotic at the moment. I said, hell, they're going to get me, so I'm going to get all the schooling I can get. Okay. That, with that, that gave me about one more quarter. Ah. Then I got drafted. And what, when, uh, what, what time, when, when, when was that? I got my draft notice, I think, in December uh, 43. December 43? And okay. was uh, inducted with a bunch of other guys in uh, around January 44. Is that right? That would that can't be right. No, 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 no. It was December 42, January 43. Okay, so you were yeah. drafted in December of 42. Yeah. January 43, you were inducted. Yeah. And where did they send you after that? Well, it's kind of interesting, if anybody cares, how, how the Army works. Okay. Uh, I got on a train load of guys uh, at Burlingame, where my father lived. Now, this in many... In, in California. Minnes California, okay. And uh, we went on down to the Presidio of Monterey. And the Presidio... The Monterey was just a place where they assembled draftees okay. and gave them their shots in a few lectures and how do you make your bed and and then they they interviewed each of these people. I am assuming that the army had put a call in to the Presidio of Monterey. We got to have some guys in the Signal Corps and we got to have some guys for the Air Force. Uh huh. So these interviewers. I don't think they had to be too uh, bright. Well, <laughs> there's another better adjective. Okay, but they didn't have to do much. They, but they, when they interviewed me, you know, this, that, and the other. Do you ever make model airplanes? Sure. You know what an aileron? Yeah, I'm in the Air Force. Uh -huh. Some guy gives another answer. He's in the <laughs> in the Signal Corps. Okay. You know? yeah. So that's how you got selected. 
for the Air Force? Because you know what selected. an aileron was? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and they put, so a train load of us went from there all the way down through Texas to uh, Biloxi, Mississippi. Okay. And uh, I think I was there. Who's the guy that wrote this story? Uh, Biloxi Blues. Okay. He was there. Okay. Not that I knew him, but he was there then. So I went through basic training with these guys that I came with, and they would begin shipping out to mysterious places, Cook okay. and Baker School and uh, uh -huh. whatever else they had. And I'm left. And by God, uh, I, I'm in with a new bunch of guys, and I started basic training again. And I went through that. And it happened a third time. I said, what the, something is wrong here. And you I kept went, losing your records or something? I, I went down to the squadron headquarters. I don't know. I'm probably the only guy that had two years of university, and they didn't know what to do with me. I was going to say, you, since Stanford is a fairly well-known school, I would have thought they had wanted you to use your obvious intellect or something. Well, or something. They, at that time when I went down to complain, they said, look at uh, what were you studying? Well, I was beginning engineering. Well, you know, you could go over to the base engineer's office and, and maybe fit in there, do a little drafting uh -huh. or whatever they had to do. And I went over to the report. It was a very small office with a drafting table, nobody in it. And I said, I don't want to do this. So I went back and bailed out of that. And okay, what school are you qualified for? What have you got? Well, you got the radio, we got air mechanics, and I don't know. I'll, I'll choose air mechanics. Because I thought I was going to get off the base. You know, they'll send me out. Well, they sent me to air mechanic school, but they had one at Keysville Field. <laughs> and that was interesting. It was uh, <clears throat> how many weeks? I'm not, I can't remember. Maybe six weeks. If it was six weeks, they had six buildings. Uh -huh. You get in this building and you study electrical systems. In this building, you study something else, and then all the way through, and you're through with their mechanics school. And you became a flight engineer? Well, you now, the building? most of those guys who came through there were shipped out to work on various airfields, uh -huh. domestically or foreign or whatever. Yes. But there was a group of us, and I don't know how they selected them, they put on a train. You know, nobody asked me after that. Okay. Put me on a train. Where are we going? You're going to Laredo, Texas, to Aerial Gunnery School. Ah. Uh -huh. So I went to uh, Laredo Gunnery School. I'd never been in an airplane before. We learned about the pursuit curves and how the turrets worked, and, and I don't know what. And finally got in, uh, in an AT-6. Uh -huh. You know, with a machine gun, and you had to fire at a sleeve target. That was a target towed by another airplane? Towed by another airplane. And they, they had your bullets marked. They had a system. Boy, they had a system. So they knew who, who hit the target. <laughs> they knew who hit what. And how did you do there? Well, I must have, I must have pleased the pilot. I'm, you know, uh -huh. He gave me the high sign, and I got the ammunition ready, and I'm ready and ready to go. Uh, he may have slipped in a little closer than some other guy, you know, uh -huh. but I shot the hell out of it. Ah, okay. So uh, when he got all through, they mocked him. Down. Like, I don't know how many hundreds of guys, and I'm number six. Wow. Little old well Bill Hickok. Yeah. Huh? So now they want to make me an instructor there. Okay. Yeah, well, <clears throat> I showed up for instruction, you know, and I had no lesson plan, I didn't, and I didn't do very well. I probably an, could have if I worked at it. At being an instructor. Yeah. yeah. But uh, they allowed me not to be an instructor. And then, I'm, now I'm in the, in the chain, the food chain, whatever. And I, I go home for, uh, what, a week leave or whatever they gave me. And then off to Salt Lake City. Now, Salt Lake City was a place where they brought these guys in, gunners, Bombardiers, navigators, pilots. The crew. That's where they formed up the crews. They didn't tell you that at that point. You just showed up in Salt Lake City. Yeah. And next thing you knew, you were assigned to a crew. Yeah. Is that what you? Is that when you met Johnson? Uh, I, I I can't recall meeting Johnson. Maybe until we got they shipped us out of there to Colorado Springs. Okay. Which is where then we did our B twenty four training. Okay. And then I'm a part of Johnson's crew. Because when my dad was 
the officers were formed, and then the listed men were formed as two units, and then they were merged. Yeah. So I don't know if that was true in your case or not. Well, as far as I know, it wasn't. But okay. you know, I can be wrong. I didn't so research you, all of this. But anyway, so you in Colorado Springs is when you remember being as Colorado employee. Springs is where we did our training. The enlisted men lived as enlisted men in the barracks, and the officers somewhere else. But we spent a lot of time together. Training we would go to town together. You and the enlisted men, or you and the enlisted men and officers? Enlisted men and officers. And officers, OK. And I will have to say that I think that my pilot, M.L. Johnson, was uh, a superior man. He was only two years older than I am. Mm, OK. Uh, but he, he had the characteristics that, that a crew commander ought to have. Which were? He was uh, calm. He was not excited. Uh, he knew pretty much what he was doing. But he also had good relationships with the people on the crew, or at least with me. Uh -huh. And did you call him Lieutenant, or did you call him John? Johns. Johns? We did not. Uh, there was never a time when we had to salute these people, or there was no. Uh, there was a. Johns told me that our uh, uh, navigator, when we first got together, lined up all the enlisted men. I don't remember this at all. And said, "Now you guys salute me." And, and you know, and Johnson took him aside and said, "We're not doing that." Wow. Okay. And that's kind of a guy he was. And I am still a friend of M. L. Johnson. I call him often on the phone, and I hope one day to go and see him. Has, uh, I assume he's not a member of the association or the veterans group. Oh yes, he he's a, he's a member, but he doesn't come. The guys that he knew aren't here anymore, and he's not that interested in... Did he used to come? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And it's too bad he's not interested in making new friends, okay. which is what I've had to do, too. But you're in still contact with him? Yeah. yeah. Are you in contact with other members of your crew? Well, there's only one other member alive, and that's the, uh, the co-pilot, Clark. Clark. And, boy, he was, a good, he was a good flyer, that guy. Was he better than Johnson? Yes, he was better than Johnson. But Johnson was the crew commander. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in flying in formation, Johnson used to, you know, work the to stay here. Yeah. There, yeah. The this other, other guy, guy was, was gifted. He could take the wingtip and stick it on your lap and just. So even though he was flying out of the right seat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Could, okay. Did Johnson let him fly most of the time? Uh, I don't think so. But he did. Uh, they shuffled people around, so he flew some missions as the pilot. Clark did. Yeah. So he was ultimately promoted to the pilots. Well, seat. I don't. I don't know if that was permanent or not. It had, it had something to do with uh, breaking up the crew. For instance, uh, all of us were flew a few missions. I flew two or three as a flight engineer for somebody else's crew. crew? Okay. Is so this when you first got over. Yeah. Not okay. no, not right away. No. Okay. But later on. Okay. So that we had different. Uh, Accumulated different missions a little bit, and uh, and I I don't know when Clark. I think after I left, Clark flew as a pilot. Okay. But well, this gets into another story. But at the end of my career, the last mission I flew, five of us and our crew flew with the mission commander. It was kind of a made-up crew. In the lead plane. In the lead plane. Yes. And that uh, and that plane went down over the Adriatic. Hmm. Yeah, we all had a bailout, and it, uh, it, two of our crew and two others were lost in that mission. Hmm. Uh, so, but that was a, it turned out. Then I had forty-eight mission credits, and anybody with over forty that was involved there, they were went finished with their dip. tour. When was that? That was in, uh, well, the mission was on September 12th, 1944. 44. So some of our people, like Johnson, Clark, Morgan Besser, the bombardier, uh, had some missions to fly even after I was through. OK. So going, going back to the Colorado Springs, so the crew formed in Colorado Springs. Yeah. Now, did you fly a plane over, or did you go by boat? Or? Oh, yeah. We, after we were through with Colorado Springs, we put on a train, our crew and others, I guess, 
And I think we went to Harrington, Kansas. Johnson differs with me on where we were. Oh, OK. But you went to some place. <laughs> yeah. Where they had a whole row of bland, brand new V-24s. Did they <laughs> pick one? Yeah. And well, I don't know if we picked it. We were assigned one. OK. And um, so we had this, gee whiz, wow, that's our plane. We threw all our gear in there. And there's a guy who probably made a living out of painting uh, on these V-24s. Nozart? Nozart? Yeah, yeah, Nozart. OK. You guys got to have something on this. Oh, gee, nobody knew. What? So finally, the, the bombardier said, OK, how about uh, uh, a, a battering ram? OK. So we called it battering ram, and this guy painted a, you know, what I call a truculent ram on each side of the nose. OK. And then we got in that <clears throat> and flew it down to Palm Beach, Florida. And I think we stayed about two days. There must have been some paperwork involved. And we got orders. We flew out of Palm Beach. And, and this is like the Underground Railroad. <clears throat> we flew from Palm Beach to Trinidad. Now, there's other guys ahead of us <clears throat> and other guys behind us. Right. Stayed overnight in Trinidad. You don't see Trinidad. You just, you're in the barracks. Right. You fly out of there to Belém, Brazil, yes. which is a sizable city right. at the mouth of the Amazon right. uh, overnight. And then we flew out of there to Natal, Brazil, which, of course, is the farthest east point, point right. of South America. We stayed overnight there. Then we flew from Bele or Natal across the ocean to Dakar, Africa. Yes. And I've written a little story about this, and John tells me that he, he told our navigator, Florzak, who he, whom he didn't exactly trust. <laughs> he didn't trust his navigator? And he said, Florzak, if we have to ditch this airplane before we get to Dakar, I got a 45. I'm going to shoot you right between the eyes. And so did Florzak land you in? in Florzak uh, got us there. Okay. We got to that car. And then uh, uh, fly. Uh, if I was flying, we'd have flown up the coast, you know, along the where you could see the beach. Yes. And he had passed the Atlas Mountains, and then I would turn into Marrakech. Yes. We didn't do that. We went over inland a bit, and we had to go through a pass in the Atlas Mountains to come down on Marrakech. And that was dumb as hell. We had to get up to twelve or 15,000 feet before we could land at Marrakech. So did... Uh, we could have gone around those I mountains. I say, as part of your pre-brief, did, did somebody tell you that there was this mountain pass that you could fly through, or did Some, Johnson well, just figure it out by himself? I don't know. I was not... Privy to that? Privy to that information. Okay. But probably they knew about that. Okay. But I knew damn well, without anybody telling me anything, you could fly around these mountains That's to get to Marrakech. Okay. So... Okay, one... Just one night, Marrakesh. We took off, flew across uh, French uh, Tunisia or whatever, and we landed at, uh, at Tunis. Yes. Now, in Tunis was a, a busy place, and you could see some of the marks of war. There were pieces of equipment that sure. off on the side of the road and that kind of thing. So you began to get the flavor. Wow, we're, we're, we're getting, getting close, closer. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> and we flew from Tunis <clears throat> out over. Um, Sicily, uh -huh. and went right. It was, it was like a, a lesson in geography, you know. Right. And I'm just standing there at the waist window. You get the front row seat. And the flight engineer stood between the pilot and the co-pilot. Is that right? Not, not my, not in my crew. Not in your crew. Okay. I just looking out the waist window. Oh, okay. Now, yes, I flew a mission, our first mission. Okay. Where we had a uh, an instructor pilot named Donald Stone. Yes. He put me between. The two the pilots on that first mission. Okay. But while you're with Johnson, you just looked out the way. Johnson and... Johnson had a he just had a bugabear about losing an engine. And he wanted you to be the first one to know. Huh? No, yeah. Or the yeah. second one to better yeah. go on. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so we flew over Sicily and there was uh, Mount Etna and holy cow. Wow. And it, it's not long before you're across into Southern Italy, we landed at Gioia, where I think the headquarters were for the 15th Air Force. Okay. And so they didn't send you to Foji? No. Okay. So we landed at Gioia, and uh, so, you know, I'm not privy to what's going on, but uh, uh, Johnson got his orders, 
and they sent us down to the 376, which is not very far from Joliet. And is that the first time you heard of the 376? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I never knew anything about it. But it's our airplane, you know. We, right. We, <clears throat> the, so uh, you you still were flying the battering ram yeah. down to the 376? Yeah. Okay. So we landed there, and uh, they uh, signed us uh, a barracks. Uh, the 376, probably different from any of the other groups, had some buildings that were built. The, the the airport once, or the runway was once German. Right. And there were some wood buildings. Mm -hmm. And we were housed in a wood building. Our crew, a, a room about the size of this. The whole crew was? No, just enlisted men. Just enlisted men, okay. Officers, I think, were in tents. Okay. Most other crews were in tents. But we had a, we had a room. Building. Real yeah. Wow. yeah. Okay. Okay, we got our gear there. There's nothing to it. You're only carrying a, a flight bag or what do we call them, B4 bag. Next day, we are on the list of guys who are going to fly the mission to Munich. Okay. Uh, so we get up in the morning uh, whenever they get you up. And uh, we were escorted by truck to an aircraft, but which it wasn't. But it wasn't battering ram. It wasn't battering ram. It was a, a, an old desert ship ah. called uh, Long John Silver. Okay, I remember the name. Okay. Yeah. That was your first plane? That, that's the plane we flew with the instructor pilot, Stone. Now, was Johnson then the co-pilot? Yeah. So yeah. Stone was the pilot and yeah. Johnson kind of... Well, Stone was in the co-pilot seat. Oh, Stone was in the co-pilot seat. Yeah. Okay. But he was in command. But he was in command. Okay. Yeah. And they differ about who landed that airplane. <laughs> Stone and Johnson? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I think Stone is correct. Stone says he landed it, or yeah. But now that was it. In my view, it is one of the most difficult missions we ever flew. The Munich. The yeah. First one. To uh, no, it, did I say Munich? Damn it! It was Wiener, Wiener Neustadt. Wiener, Wiener. And what date was that? That was uh, May 29, 44. May 29, 44. Mm -hmm. So okay, we were up. Uh, I transferred the fuel out of the you know auxiliaries into the main tanks and. And then uh, we come over the mountains, which are not very high, into Austria. And we're in the Graz Valley, and by this time at about 24,000. Mm -hmm. And we're flying toward the, wherever that target is. And I could see between the pilots and out the window sheet, windshield what looked like a swarm of bees. It was, you know, something is out there okay. moving. Yes. Turned out to be black fighters, smoke from anti-aircraft. Oh, oh, black. Okay, eighty-eight millimeters. And uh, boy, it, it was right at our altitude. There was no guessing about it. And we just flew into it. And I've got to say, I think this guy Donald Stone has got to be as brave a man as there is in the world. He knew what that meant. We didn't. You didn't. You were too young. No? Yeah. Or too new. And we flew into the goddamnedest maelstrom that ever happened. And those shells were going off. I mean, you know, just 10 yards out, over, boom, pow, bang, boom. And the plane would go like that. And I thought, I couldn't, st I couldn't stand up. We had to put uh, a steel helmet on Black helmet? And, a, and a flak vest. And I couldn't stand there. I had, to, I had to sit down on it. There was a little bench in the flight deck. And I was just waiting for something to blow us up. So we came out of that. It, you know, it doesn't take long. Mm -hmm. What? 30, 40 seconds, maybe. We came out of that. Bombs are gone, and the bomb doors are shut. And I could look down in the, into the bomb bay, which is darkened, and it was just full of holes. So it could have been 100 holes. Wow, from the flak. Yeah. Yeah. And then it turns out the radio transmitter wouldn't work. Uh, the trim tab cables were cut. The main cables were not, but still they need, the, they need to trim these uh, mm -hmm. settings. And uh, there was a fire in the, in the ammunition box in the waist that uh, Otto Graf, who was the other waste gunner, put out with a fire extinguisher. And he said, I had never seen a fire extinguisher before in an airplane, and I never saw one again after that, but he had one and he put the fire out. Mm -hmm. So we came off, we couldn't stay in formation. Why is that? 
They couldn't control the plane. Oh, I left one out. <clears throat> Number three engine was uh, pouring gasoline. So we feathered the propeller on that. Uh -huh. So now we got three engines that don't have the trim tabs. They couldn't fly it well enough to stay in formation. So did Stone tell, tell Johnson to take the plane out of formation? Well, or just that Johnson much I don't know, but we soon were. By yourself? We certainly, no, they, they assigned somehow, they assigned the Lieutenant Hintonock to fly with us. Al? Uh, Al yeah, Hintonock? yeah. And he, I think, was ahead of us and we were behind him. The two of us flew out of Austria down over the Adriatic. Now, we had a little discussion earlier on, just after we came off the uh, off of the bomb target, and uh, Stoney consulted me, and he and he consulted Johnson. He's, you know, what kind of shape are we in here? What's what's our trouble? Then he asked me if we had enough fuel to get back. <laughs> I don't know if we got enough fuel to get back. <laughs> Did you have a slide we were with you at the yeah, time I didn't to figure have it out? any way of figuring that out. <clears throat> so we, we so we went back. Then we got down further, closer to as far as Foggia, and they thought, you know, I think Stoney did anyway, and with probably with Johnson, and I had no part in that. That it's time to put this plane down. We may not have that much fuel. Mm -hmm. So we, we arranged to to, and I don't know how, to land at a fighter base at Foggia. Okay. And, uh, and now Johnson and, and uh, Stoney differ on their stories about this. <laughs> okay. I think, uh, I think uh, Stoney was flying. And we came down on the approach to the runway. Stoney decided to activate that uh, dead engine, number three. The only so one that was leaking fuel. So he had, yeah, he had even power. Yes. So he did that and immediately it caught fire. Okay. So we're coming down to the runway and just fire just, uh, all I could see was fire out one of those windows. But he put it down and he ran it off the runway into a field next to the runway, yes. which slowed us up considerably. And hell, we had the bomb doors open, we had all the hatches open, the plane <coughs> rolls to a stop and everybody's out. And the, the guys at the base, they had a fire crew. Uh huh. And they were there. Yes. When that plane stopped, they were there. Yes. And they put the fire out. Okay. So that was the uh, end of our trip there. And uh, I th there was discussion with the tower there, and I, I, I don't know anything about that, but we finally left there in Hintonock's plane. He landed. He landed with you. And we climbed into his plane, went back to the 376. Now, we, f we knew sometime after we got back, and I don't know how long it took, that uh, the battering ram didn't make it. It, it shut went, down? It went down. On that same mission? Same mission. And then years later, I found out that uh, there were only five survivors. Um, the, the, the pilot, Lieutenant uh, Edward Whaley, and four of his men went down with it. Now, we have today... Uh, at this reunion, we've got one of those survivors, uh, uh, Moore. Luther uh, Moore? Uh, Luther Moore, yeah. He, he was a uh, bombardier on that crew, and he's here today with his son-in-law. Okay. I haven't seen him yet. So, Battering Ram was lost on his first mission? Yeah. Brand new B-24J, and the old B-24D... Well, it it was a, it needed a lot of work. <clears throat> they left it up there at Foggia. It got a new wing or something and knew everything. And, and it was returned back to the... It was returned back to the 376, and Stoney went up to get it. After it was fixed? Yeah. Did, yeah. did it fly any more missions? Well, it must have, and I don't know what its history would be. Okay. Yeah. Because I don't remember how long I was there. It was decided I'm through with some others. And autograph, oh, autograph, the other uh, uh, waste gunner was part of the five. Uh, this was the mission that you were shot down on. Yeah, yeah we, we weren't really shot down. Well, you bailed so out. I'll tell there. you about that mission. Okay. So we, that mission was on September 12th. 
and we took off with the mission commander who was uh, Graf. Wait a minute, I got his name. I'll dig it up. Uh, but he was commander, and the various bomb groups involved. I mean, he was the leader of the whole thing. Of the whole wing. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it took quite a while to assemble all those planes. Sure. And then you fly up the Adriatic again. And I had to transfer the fuel. We'd been up about two hours, and we hadn't gone anywhere. Hadn't gone anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so somehow, as we were gaining altitude, we were about 18,000, something busted in the tail section. And the tail began to go like this. Really? With two... I didn't know that. Oh, uh, I, w I was transferring the fuel at that moment, yeah. at that time. Yes. In this, in, and in this ship, which I think it was another desert ship, had to go back through the waist and up in the wing route. Yes. And that's where all the valves were. Right. And I'm on oxygen and I'm not on the intercom. Yes. And I did the work. <clears throat> then I come down, back up through the Bombay, and I get up in the flight deck, sit down, and the Emergency bell rings, the bombs are salvoed, and everybody's hollering, and I can see parachutes. Out of your plane? Yeah. Yeah? And I don't know anything you about You have no anything. idea what's going on? Yeah. <clears throat> so I clamped on my chute, and I stepped down to the bomb bay. Yes. Well, there were two guys behind me. Otto Graf was flying the top turret that time, and the pilot, uh, god damn it. I'll get his name out of here. Uh, but, uh, gee, I, I could see sunshine, ocean. Uh, and, and as far as I know, that I can't feel the plane vibrating. I yeah. didn't know what the hell they're talking about. So I, I kind of hesitated, and the pilot behind me said, Get out! <laughs> so I went out. You're blocking progress. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And it turned out when I did go out, <clears throat> apparently the plane went into a spin, and the wingtip came by and brushed the pilot. Really? And Otto Graf was still in it. Was still in the plane? Yeah. So it went around several times before he got out of it. Wow. So when I went out, you know, I went out uh, in tuck position back to the wind, nothing to it. <clears throat> and Have you I, been taught how to bail out of a plane? No, I don't think so. Okay. Everybody knows what they ought to do. Okay. But yeah, I know you don't want to go out tumbling. Yes. You tumble and you pull on the, the, the cord, and these damn clamps will come up and bust you in the face. Okay. Okay. So I, I, I didn't do that. <clears throat> so I came down on my back to the ground. But then I turned over to say, you know, 18,000 feet, I got a lot of time. Yes. So I looked down below me, and that airplane that I just jumped out of yes. is below me in a flat spin. Yes. So I figured I'd pull the string. To get out of the way. Yeah. yeah. Now, did you land in the water or on land? Oh, no, in the water. You land in the water? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And I, you could count the chutes. Everybody got out, all open. But in the end, four of those guys didn't survive. They drowned? Yeah. One of them was our navigator, Florzak who never wore his May West because it didn't look good. He was a piece of work. He drowned. Yes. And I think uh, there was a guy flying in the tail, and I, I knew him kind of halfway because he was a, a really smart kid named uh, Aronowitz from Brooklyn. And uh, Aronowitz, I'm sure, did not know how to swim. I don't suppose too many guys from Brooklyn knew how to swim. I don't know. That would be a traumatic experience. Sure. You hit that water, you're in a harness, the damn thing, and you don't know how to swim. You're in Panic City right there, and right. you don't make good decisions. Well, he didn't survive. Um, Morgan Besser, also from Brooklyn on our crew, who was a navigator, or bombardier, he did survive, but there he had some trouble. He swallowed a lot of salt water. Salt water. They had to send him to the hospital. But for, for a guy who knows how to swim, it was like an exercise at the YMCA. I didn't have any trouble. So did the air rescue pick you up then? Then, well, I, and then I assume, being the mission commander, and we had gone down, everybody knew about it. 
Wrong. Well, maybe everybody didn't know about it. Okay. No time to radio SOS. Okay. Yeah. So we, we are floating away. And by the way, every man's alone. Once you hit that water, if you're spread out and the next guy is 50 yards away, you can't even see him. The water was, uh, it was windy. Mm -hmm. It was white caps. Mm -hmm. So you don't know any, you don't see anybody. So, uh, you know, an hour goes by and I thought, well, they'll be here. They'll be here. Two hours go by. So you're just bobbing in the water? Bobbing with your in the water. Ass. Three hours go by. Four hours go by. And I said, God damn, maybe they didn't get the word. Well, there was a rock about five miles away sticking out of the water. I thought, God, instead of drowning here, I'm going to go for that rock. I'm, it's a damn good thing I didn't. I think it's about to do that when uh, a Spitfire showed up. Uh, and somebody had, uh, who hears better than I do had uh, heard it and died, pulled his sea marker. Okay. So I could see that sea marker. So I saw the spit, I pulled my sea marker, and he goes, zoom, like that. You know? Yeah. He's guiding a British boat out of the island of Vis. Oh, okay. Well, at just about that same time, of, uh, an American PBY out of Foggia or somewhere landed downwind. And I must have been the last guy upwind or downwind, downwind. And so I'm the first guy they came up to. And I swam over and, uh, and they pulled me out and they threw all my clothes away. And I meant to st save the, uh, the kit that they put in there for survival. You know, anybody would like that for a souvenir. Sure. Well, I wasn't thinking very well and I let them throw my suit away. Souvenir away. That too. And I had nothing, nothing but an army blanket. Now, when you landed then, did you take the chute off so you wouldn't get pulled under? Or? Yeah, yeah. When I hit the water, I ducked underwater and unbuckled the harness and got rid of it. I'm still underwater. And then I swam up and out of the way of the harness. I didn't want it to catch me sure. by the foot or some other thing. And, and that's, that's the difference between the guy who knows how to swim and the I guy who say, doesn't. That's, so because you knew how to swim and were comfortable in the water. Oh, yeah, sure. I spent my life in the water. You know. But in those days, half the people in, in the country didn't know how to swim. Huh. It, it, it's a stupid thing, but I think people put more energy into that these days. So you see our rescue picked you up, flew you back to Fuji? Well, <clears throat> so... I got in there, and I think they also picked up Otto. I'm not sure who else was with me. And then the Brit Brit British boat uh, had some. Uh -huh. Okay, we tried to take off in this thing against these white caps. And they... Pretty soon they smashed in the front. Of this PBY? Yeah. yeah. So here we are. The ocean water comes down the gangway in this PBY. So we had to get out of that into a rubber raft. <coughs> okay. And then we got over into the British boat. boat. Stark naked. But they had uh, old, uh, um, you know, fatigue suits they gave us to wear. And then the British commander on that boat and the, and the guy who had the PBY had a heated discussion. <clears throat> if they'd left that PBY alone, it would have been, it was floating. And it could have been saved. Yes. But the British guy gets a little dramatic about, you know, the Germans will find it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think some guys go to too many movies. <laughs> and he, he sank it with his 40 millimeter. He blew it out of the water? Yeah, yeah. So, so this was an American PBY getting yeah, blown out of the water yeah, by a British boat? Yeah, okay. yeah. So then they took us back about a two-hour trip to get back to the island of Vis. Okay. Now, you, I'm not sure you know all about Vis. Was a, it had a, an airstrip, and it was a place for emergency landings. Right. And it did look like something out of the movies. It, the island was, must have been a volcanic island of some kind, of steep, steep uh, slopes, and then landing strip at the top. And we drove by that landing strip, and there were pieces of airplane on both sides of that landing strip. Right. So uh, they kept us overnight, and, and a, a 
fl a plane came out from uh, from uh, 376 and picked us yeah. all up and took us back. So at that point, your flying days were over. And my flying days were over. So did they fly you back to the U.S. or did you take a boat back? Oh, no, I went, they went back on a huge, um, you know, what do you call it? Troop, troop, ship? troop carrier. New, relatively fast, no escort. Okay. And then what happened when you landed? What happened when you got back to the States? Well, you get back to, to Newport News, Virginia. Okay. And then we uh, piled onto a train and went all the way, I went all the way across the country to California. Okay. Uh, and wound up at the Santa Ana Air Base. There was some kind of an induction or whatever center for return. And they fed you like you were the king of something. Because you were, you were a combat veteran? Yeah, yeah. They all saluted and... And I guess I had the option of going to several places that they may have laid out for me. Uh -huh. And I chose March Air Force Base, which is right there right. at Riverside. So they sent me to March Air Force Base, and then I spent quite a long time as a as a um, gunnery instructor, a, a flight cr crew. I went up with them. Teaching new guys how to... Yeah, I don't know what I taught them, but uh, we, the idea was to fire off so many rounds. Right. And if we didn't get them all off, we just kicked them out the door. Okay. And they wound up in the desert. In the desert. So don't go wandering around that desert. So how long did you... Or I should say, when were you discharged? Well, then, <clears throat> see, I was there for, I don't know, eight months. And it's, then it's, the war is still on. I think the war with uh, Germany ended uh, while I was doing that. And, but uh, a number of us at that point were assigned to go to B-29 school. Okay. And they shipped us out of uh, March Air Force Base to uh, Pueblo, Colorado. There was some kind of a B-29 school. So you were training to fly B-29s? Well, that was the idea. I never saw a B-29. Oh. Because while we were up there, uh, the atom bomb was dropped, and Japan is out of the war. The war's over. I never saw anything of a B-29. And they sent me back to uh, March Air Force Base. Okay. Is that where you were discharged? Then, uh, well, not exactly. It was almost. <laughs> uh, I finally got on some kind of orders, and they sent me to uh, Marysville. Where's that at? Uh, up north of Sacramento. Okay. And that's where I was discharged. Oh, okay. And I was—I remember being in a in a barracks with guys who had been in the South Pacific. You know, you, there was the point system. I had a lot of points for being combat veteran, and there were other guys, not combat veterans, who had maybe the same kind of points, but they got them because they were in there for four or five years. Yes. And all these guys had been in for years. Yes. I never opened my mouth. You know, I was in for uh, maybe two years. Right. So these guys have been in the service even before the war. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But we all got discharged. And I don't know what arrangements were made for us at all. All I remember is I walked out of that place, out to the highway, and stuck up my thumb. Oh. And I hitchhiked all the way back to Burlingame, and south did, of San Francisco. And did you go back to Stanford? I went, yeah, school had just started. So I was about a week late getting back to school. So they took you right back in and yeah. graduated from Stanford? Yeah, yeah. And then in what? Industrial engineering. Industrial engineering. Yeah. Okay. Which, you know, is not a very interesting thing. Now, did you go in the GI Bill? Yeah, GI Bill. Mary Pat and I were married. Okay. Uh, that June. So you knew her before the war? I knew her you... before the war. Okay. And uh, so we, we, at first it was a little tough. We had to live with her family for how long, dear? Six months? Nine, nine months. Yeah. Okay. You, yeah okay. you couldn't find a room. Uh, then... Uh, what happened? We we got uh, we did get a room in San Bruno. This is still about twenty five miles from the campus. Uh huh. And I'd uh, somehow. When did I get your family car anyway? Uh, and I drive to school. All right. Okay. We're now here. Huh? Okay. Uh, 
So, you know, eventually we got put into what Stanford called uh, uh, Stanford Village. It was the old Dibble General Hospital. Student housing? Yeah, student thing. And uh, when my point still counted, we were, we and a couple next to us were the only people in this whole complex who didn't have children. Okay. But I had some priority. So we lived in that for about a year. And then after I graduated, we bought a house in Palo Alto. Been there ever since. Been there ever since. Yeah. Now, did the 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 what you said you had been going to Stanford before you were drafted? So yeah. Did, they, did those two or however many years count towards your uh, oh yeah degree? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, it, it's interesting to me how all these things work. I would say of all the guys that were with me at Stanford before we each went our several ways in the into the war, that most of them wound up still going to school or medical school or none of them ever got shot at oh except you yeah uh, and that's still going on today i believe oh, okay. you know these guys who get who die in iraq are too many medical students or yale men well that yeah. unfortunately sometimes is the case depending on your point yeah, of view yeah yeah so you had said so your you and your wife had met before you went off yeah, to the war, did yeah. you write to each other while oh, you yeah. were in the oh, service? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, uh, Mary Pat was going to school at Berkeley then. Okay. And did, did she go, well, I should be talking to her. Did, yeah. did, she, did she graduate then? She graduated before I did. Before you did, okay. And uh, became a teacher uh, at Visalia High School while I was still at March Field. Okay. So I would run up to Visalia when I get a chance. Okay. And uh, and then finally I got out and uh, and then Mary Pat uh, did some teaching uh, while I was at Stanford. She had, uh, oh, did I, come on, Mom. What? It's school. Oh, okay. Is that what Okay. And what did you, what did, after you graduated, where did you work? Well, you know, jobs when I graduated weren't like they are today. <laughs> okay. Um, you didn't have all these fancy avenues to go down. Okay. I went to work for Swift and Company Meat Pack. The Meat Company? Yeah. Okay. Uh, with the idea of being a time and study man. That's and, pretty boring work. And is that what you became, a time and study? No, they put me eventually into the purchasing department, and I learned a little bit about that. And then I left them because, you know, a big operation like that, uh, they got plants all over. They would have sent me to Brookfield, Wisconsin or somewhere because mm. the guy I worked with did go there, became the mayor of Brookfield. Ah, okay. So, uh, no, I finally went into uh, engineering sales. Uh, I first worked for Fairbanks Morse Company. Okay. And uh, ultimately, I worked for a, uh, a manufacturer's rep company in, in San Francisco and learned the trade. And then I became, with, uh, I, I started a company, manufacturer's rep company, with three other guys. Uh -huh. and, and I was made the president of that, and, and I kept that up for about 25. Well, it wasn't that long. 15 years. Okay. And I'm still working mornings. Still working mornings at, with, at the company you yeah. founded? Yeah. Oh, that's good. As an employee. As an employee? Yeah. You don't own the company? I don't own it. You, but you work for them? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're drawing clo closer. Anything, any perspectives or anything you'd like to add? You, you, you've had some interesting experiences in the war. and. Well, there are other stories I could tell, but... Um, I, I, I kind of thought that maybe Dave Ulbrich was going to be uh, probing into the relationship somehow between the men on the crew. Oh, know? would you like to comment? I, well, I'll, I'll, I'm sorry if I short. misled you. I'm yeah. sorry if I misled you. Yeah, I will give cred, all credit in the world to uh, our pilot Johnson and uh, our co-pilot Clark. Uh, we all we had good relationships, but there's still there are guys who don't communicate well. The one was the navigator, Plorzak, and uh, one of our gunners, our ball gunner Wheeler, 
didn't get, we didn't get to know them that well. They, they don't reveal themselves. Okay. And you think being that close, you would. Yeah. So uh, that's my comment. Uh, th that's a story yet to be told, I think. And maybe Dave can take that up on his next. Uh, well, maybe we can arrange to interview you next yeah, year. Yeah, yeah. So, or if there's some time slots empty, maybe we can we can re reconvene if they're later on in the yeah in the show. So now uh, they've died off, uh, and the only ones left are Johns and Clark and me. And I think Orzak's sister contacted me. Yeah, yeah. And you and I communicated. Yeah. With her, yeah, because she never knew what happened to her brother. She never knew, and I, I think I provided some kind of information. Yeah, but I had to say that I didn't know him that well. Yeah. He was not an easy man to know. I think he tried to keep. I, I don't think he wanted people to know him. <laughs> that, yeah, yeah. My, my yeah. father apparently came back also changed. My sister, my his sisters, my aunts, say he was not the same when he when yeah. he came back. Yeah. Do you think your husband is the same when he came back? Um, yeah. Yes. So. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I don't see. If you've come through it, that uh, it shouldn't change anything, you know. And I don't think it did. Okay. I mean, sure, I'm lucky to be alive, but uh, I don't. Uh, I don't. You know, you hear stories over and over again. The building falls down, and some of the people get out, and the ones that get out say, geez, i got to thank God for saving me. What are the people supposed to say that got lost in the, in the, the pile of rubble? Thank the for not saving me? Yeah. So I don't think God works that way. Okay. And maybe that's the end of the story. Okay. But you, <laughs> you survived and... Yeah. But uh, uh, some of it is, is, is just plain luck. Mm -hmm. But I did have interesting experiences, and I met some good guys, and, uh, and I try to keep up with those that I can. Mainly that's Johnson. Okay. Well, we'll have to. Anyway, I think that's it. Thank you very much for your All right. time. Thank you for uh, your interest. Oh, I'm, I'm, it's my pleasure <laughs> to take notes. So.